Tell him, McCluskey. Tell him what time it is. Little Hand says it's time to rock and roll. All you people are so scared of me. Come quietly or there will be trouble. Man, that's just me. I'm Batman. This is Sparta! There is a tiger in the bathroom. I'm an excellent driver. If it bleeds, we can kill it. Pop quiz, hot shot. Keep the change, you filthy animal. It's you. No, it's not. That twist brought us the wrong Alice. Ooh, it's the wrong Alice? You're absolutely Alice. I'd know you anywhere. I'd know him anywhere. Hello and welcome to this week's Monday Movie Show. Now this is a bit of a strange Monday Movie Show. For one, we're on a Tuesday. That's because there was a few bits and bobs that's pushed us to a Tuesday this week. We'll blame the bank holiday. And the second thing is, I'm saying we, but there is only me. Because this is where Andrew would actually chime in and blah blah and where we would back and forth and the usual stuff that you're normally used to. When in fact... Andrew has gone and deserted me this week. He is busy sorting out his new flat with decorating and all that stuff. That's the excuse what he's using anyway. Whether it's true or not, eh, I don't know. I think he just wants a break from me, to be honest. So, next week's show will be hosted by him. Yeah, I don't think that'll actually happen. So, on this week's show, I am condensing it down into a bit of a 60-minute show rather than the usual hour and a half, two hours, because it is me, and you will not want to hear me ramble on for an hour and a half, two hours. I can barely stand my own voice. You don't have to actually go through that suffering anyway. So, what I'll do is I will bring you the latest movie news, uh, the UK box office top 10 and the Blu-ray and DVD top 10, as well as I am actually reviewing films as well. In the cinema section, I'll be looking at Fast and Furious 7, or Furious 7 for the nice people that listen in in the US, and Kidnapping Mr. Heineken, or Heineken, or it's also known as Kidnapping Freddy Heineken. And on Blu-ray and DVD, I'll be looking at Predestination Exists from the Mind Behind the Blair Witch Project, because every single film that Edward Sanchez has to be noted down as being the Blair Witch Project director. We also have Dark Summer, which we were supposed to be reviewing the cinema section a couple of weeks ago. And a very strange British film called Electricity. And on top of that, I will have my TV movies of the week. So let's kick things off as I normally do. This is going to feel really strange because I won't have anybody back and forth with me. So I won't have anybody's reactions. Um, before I do that though, I keep forgetting to do this. In the bottom right-hand corner of the screen is the live chat. Click on the little the little speech bubble icon and just chat with me. Keep me company with tonight's show. Um, I am live on the 7th of April. The podcast will be out on iTunes, etc. So if you listen back, that's when uh, I recorded the show. You can also make sure you check out the website, mondaymovieshow.co.uk. Um, email us, mondaymovieshow at yahoo.com. Facebook.com forward slash mondaymovieshow. Twitter at mondaymovieshow. I'm at Cryptic Tadpole and Andrew's not getting a mention because he's not here. So, movie news. I've got a few little bits and bobs of movie news, being having a little scour around, see if there's anything interesting. And Marvel have officially announced that the Russo brothers, as of about an hour ago, that's Joe and Anthony Russo, will direct Avengers Infinity Wars Part 1 and 2. Now, we brought this news about a week and a half ago because it was rumoured that the Russo brothers will be taking over Joss Whedon because I think Joss Whedon maybe might have had enough with the Marvel Universe. I'm guessing he's probably going to steer on as producer on this on the 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 two parter, which is out next year and the year after. But um, I'm guessing he wanted to go off and direct his own movies. He'll obviously still have a, a finger in some of the other Marvel Phase Three pies. I'm guessing. But um, I, I, by the looks of things, he's just going. Yeah, I, I don't want to do any more directing on the films, and so he's handed it over to the Russo brothers, who did the last Captain America film. And they are going to be stupidly busy because they've got this, and they've got a few, they've got a few other films in the pipeline as well. So, yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens with the Russo brothers. Whether they'll get Marvel fatigue, I don't know. Um, other Marvel news is just announced about ten minutes ago is that Joss Whedon and Kevin Feige has confirmed that Age of Ultron will not have a post credit scene. It will have a little strip. There's a, a Normally about 10, 15 seconds after you've the film's finished, you get a little post, sort of like post, post credit sequence. And then after that, you have to wait about 10 minutes, 12 minutes before you get the, the end of credit sequence. Well, 
Joss Whedon and Kevin Feige have turned around and said, um, Feige, Feige, yeah, have turned around and said that there isn't going to be a post credit sequence. I'm guessing they, they, they didn't shoot um, one, so, or they weren't interested in shooting one, or they don't know how they're going to set up Phase 3 of the Marvel Universe, and so they're thinking, yeah, I don't think it's it's right us having a post credit sequence. But what do you actually think? Does every single Marvel film need to have a post credit sequence? Just let me know. Email us, mondaymovieshowyahoo.com, or, or um, tweet me on Twitter, at Cryptic Tadpole. Um, and I'll go over the best ones next week if if people actually want to see um, an end of credit sequence on every single Marvel film, or do you think it's right now to just stop doing that? Other news, I'll quickly go through this lot. James Gunn has confirmed that Karen Gillan will reprise her role as Nebula in Guardians of the Galaxy 2. Probably his obvious guess, considering if you've seen Guardians of the Galaxy, what happened to her character. Uh, Christoph Waltz has gone on record by stating that he is not playing Blofeld in the new James Bond movie, Spectre. He also confirmed his character's name is called Franz Oberhauser. Now, a lot of people speculated that he was playing um, Blofeld because of the way the trailer, the teaser trailer played out. However, he's now decided to go and, yeah, I've never said that I'm doing Blofeld. So I don't know why people, um, people think that I am doing Blofeld, so... By the looks of things, he, he wants to see it. I don't want to be associated with that character. I want to try something as a different bad guy. And so it's understandable that he just want to be Blofeld. He wants to try something different. Um, my final piece of news is 20th Century Fox has revealed that they have made a deal with Hasbro to make a Play-Doh movie with Paul Feig set to direct. Yeah, Paul Feig set to direct a movie... Played or wise. He's also doing the Ghostbusters film. I'm not going to go into that. But a played or movie for Hasbro. I know Hasbro um, wants to do a Hungry Hippos film and they want to turn a lot of their properties into films. But a played or movie? I think this is scraping the bottom of the barrel. This is scraping beyond the bottom of the barrel. It, it, it's just ridiculous. So that's it for some movie news. Um, quickly go through the box office top 10. And I'm going to settle down just a little bit. Just take it a little bit easier. Breathe a little bit more. And so at number 10 is still Alice. Um, brilliantly acted by uh, Kristen Stewart, especially, I think. Julianne Moore got the Oscar for Best Actress, but I think Kristen Stewart needs a lot of praise for her character. I think she, she handles her character really well in the film. Um, at number nine is Wild Tales, which I've not seen. I'm eager to see this as a portmanteau um, thriller. Six stories sentencing on um, different people's lives about somebody maybe being picked up for a speeding ticket and things like that. It looks a really interesting, funny, dark movie. At number eight is Focus. According to Andrew, it lacks focus. I've yet to see this movie. It's Will Smith, Margot Robbie. It looks very straight by the book kind of movie. At number seven is a new entry for Seventh Son, one of these stupid hyper violent, uh, the sorry, stupid hyper graphical over the top fantasy movies that's trying to be a lot like Clash of the Titans and feels miserably. And number six is the second best exotic Marigold Hotel, which is a film which should have went straight to TV because it it does feel more like a television film. And number five is Insurgent, very weak movie. It's it's not a very good sequel at all because what the director is trying to do is he's trying to look over the misgivings and the la lack of action. Even though there was a lot of action in the first film and he thought we need to make this much more simpler and just make it an all-out action movie with very little decent storyline in it. And Shailene Woodley does the best with her, her character. Miles Teller, I think, is the standout performance in the film. It's just the rest of the people in the movie are just misused, um, especially Ansel Elgott. If you watch the film, there is something strange with his character and it. it's badly handled. And number four is a new entry for Get Hard. And according to Andrew last week, it's terrible. It's a comedy that's not a comedy. And number three, a new entry for the SpongeBob movie, Sponge Out of Water, the second SpongeBob SquarePants movie. And this is a strange, strange film. It's a kid's movie that is completely hyped up on sugar. It just bounces all around, the, especially the first 65 minutes where it is just the traditional animation. 
after that it goes into the live action animation stuff and that doesn't work at all it, it, it loses the plot then it's just the first 70 minutes is insane it, it's just nuts it's got the animation quality of the tv series and it's got the humor of the tv series so if you love that kind of thing you, you'll love this and all i'll just say here is a crab in bondage is something i will never get out of my brain and number two is home which despite at times the animation not being as good as a lot of DreamWorks' previous films, it's not bad. It's been getting a big mass of slating from a lot of critics, but I don't think it's as bad as a lot of people are making it out to be. It flows for the 90 minutes that it's on for, the 3D is completely forgettable, the voiceovers are fine, you have to get used to the fact that um, the lead character is O, but it's voiced by um, the actor who plays Sheldon Cooper in the Big Bang Theory, and he sounds too much like him, he's got the mannerisms of Sheldon and so if you can get past that after the first 20 minutes then you'll get used to his character. I think Pig the Cat steals the show. And at number one is a new entry for Cinderella. Now the problem with Cinderella is it, it just feels like it's an out and remake. It's a remake of the uh, the animated film and I don't think we needed a like by like remake of it because it, it's just it lacks any originality which is annoying because there is a lot of films out there that, um, that 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 have used the template of Cinderella, but used their their sort of like their added their own twists to it. This one, it just feels like um, the director just thought, I can't even be bothered to to add my own twists and turns. Let, let's just make it a, a like by like remake, and it, it's a bit pointless in my opinion. A lot of people seem to like it. I just think it's a it's a bit of a pointless film because we we've seen it all before and you should not be like that when you go to see a movie when you go go to see a movie at least have some originality to it. So that that's it for the UK box office top ten. The new one will be published on the site on um, tomorrow. So that's Wednesday if you're listening to it in podcast world. First review of the night. And I'm going to take a breather in a moment because I will be playing a clip. It's Fast and Furious 7, or Furious 7. This one is directed by James Wan after uh, Justin Lin stepped away from the series and handed the reins to James Wan. Um, James Wan is more notable for horror movies under the Bloomhouse production label. He was he came to prominent with um, his directorial debut, which was Saw, and then he went off and did multiple other horror films. So this is the first action film that he's gone and done. And it stars the usual people who have been in the previous movies, which include uh, Vin Diesel. It's Paul Walker's final film. You've got um, Michelle Rodriguez and Tyrese Gibson, Ludacris, Dwayne Johnson. And so at the start of the film, you've got Dominic Toretto, who's played by Vin Diesel, uh, and his crew. They have managed to succeed and leave behind um, the mercenaries that, uh, that they managed to defeat at the end of the last film in that extremely stupid plane sequence on the longest run we ever created in the history of man and so they're trying to live an ordinary life however the person who they managed to stop his brother wants retribution it's Deckard Shaw who's played by Jason Statham in the film and he wants retribution for the death of his brother so he goes to seek out Vin Diesel or Dominic Toretto and his crew and tries to pick them off one by one and so at the start of the film you see the the thing that happened right at the post credit sequence at the end of the last film and he tries to pick them off one by one and hunts them down he plants a bomb in uh, brian o'connor's or paul walker's um, house and tries to blow up his family in that way so he thinks the best thing to do is to send them off into a secure location while they try and hunt him down now embroiled into all of this you've got this this interesting program called God's Eye which is able to um, pinpoint anybody on the planet using any kind of camera from a smartphone or a microphone or cameras from CCTV cameras any kind of camera on microphone to try and track them down so for them to try and get the um, Deckard Shaw Toretto and his crew need to try and hunt down where this God's Eye program is with the help of other people and their crew. Here's a clip that gives you a feeling or a taste of what the film's like.
Now, in that clip there, you heard um, you heard Dwayne the Rock Johnson, and the the thing with his character is he very very shows up in the film. He's in that scene there. He's in it because there there is an incident that happens to him which ultimately puts him in hospital. You'll have seen it in the trailer where he tries to break cast off his arm, and he's not very much in the film. It all centers around um, Toretto and his crew, especially. I think the movie's more interested in Toretto and O'Connor because th th this is ultimately Paul Walker's last film and so they're, they're trying to do something with O'Connor's character and see the problem I'll go with a few problems to the film first before I see the positives the problem with the film the main problem I think is it's a bit of a messy movie for the first good at least half of the movie leading up to two thirds of the film because there are so many characters that you need to follow. What one has decided to do is try to give each one of the characters a part of Toretto's crew. So like this even playing ground. And so you've got multiple story strands happening alongside um, big massive set pieces and it feels a bit muddled. For example, uh, embroiled in this, you've got Toretto and his um, Letty, who, who's played by Michelle Rodriguez. And she cropped up in the in the last film as a bad guy but then ultimately she's trying to get her memory back and so you've got that as a story strand leading alongside some of the big action set pieces you've also got the sort like squabbling between both Tyrese Gibson and Ludacris and this girl as well who's got the God's Eye program and who's played by Jordana Brewster and you've got other story elements which try to lead alongside each other so when you've got a big action set piece what one thinks that you need to have another set piece running alongside that one and it becomes a bit of a messy movie. He doesn't seem to be able to tie all the characters together properly until the last third of the film where for the last, I would say, 30, 35 minutes, you've got one humongous set piece where he gets it spot on. And this is probably down to one's lack of being able to direct an action film. See, the, the big difference between action films and horror films. With horror films, you can take your time to build up tension and then you can have an ultimate payoff where it will scare the audience. With an action film, you need to keep the, the floor of the film constantly going. And so because he's got so many characters to try and uh, work with, he's trying too much so that the movie can feel a bit crammed and a bit messy. That's not to say the film's bad because it's definitely not bad. This is the ultimate roller coaster popcorn movie. If you're into action movies, you'll absolutely love this because the set pieces are are fantastic. You've seen in the trailer where you see the car jump between three buildings. That is just barely the tip of the iceberg because you've got huge, big, explosive set pieces. And so what you might think, the ending of Fast and Furious 6 being something big, you've seen nothing yet until you see some of them in Fast and Furious 7. So... It's entertaining. It never overdoes its running time. I think what they do with Paul Walker in the film is admirable. I'm not going to go into that any further because it, it's, it might spoil a few things. But what they actually do with that, yeah, I'll just say it did bring a tear to my eye. So that, that, that I think that was um, very well handled. So the, the film itself is not the best in the series. I personally think that's Fast and Furious 5, in my opinion. But... It's it's a nice send off for one of the actors. There's some nice set pieces in a film that is just a bit too crammed and a bit too muddled. And some of the story strands could have easily been stripped back and made the movie much more of a coherent film rather than a movie where it feels like it's just multiple set pieces stitched together. The second uh, cinema release is um, Kidnapping Mr. Heineken. And um, this centers around, it's directed by Daniel Alfredson, and it stars Sam Worthington and Jim Sturgis, who plays um, two of a group of five people who, they are, they find it really difficult to live there. There's very little money of where they are, and so they, they try different things to try and get some money in. Ultimately, that leads to them coming up with an idea of where they should kidnap a billionaire played by Anthony Hopkins who plays Mr. Heineken and so they kidnap him and ultimately hold him to ransom for millions and millions and millions of dollars. Here's a clip. I want to get out of this as much as you guys. All right, but we have to let them sweat it out another week. You know, let them believe that they're, uh, that they're screw up, kill Heineken. You remind me again why we grabbed the driver. 
Well, what's your point? The question the police are asking is, uh, are these guys the real deal? Or are they just a bunch of... And if the answer is that they're a bunch of... They're going to string this out forever. So what are you trying to say? Well, we said that if they didn't pay, then there would be blood. You wrote that in the letter. This is business. It's nothing personal. And they didn't pay. I agree. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, you agree? Yeah. With him? All right, good, big man. All right, man. Slice his throat. So here's the thing with kidnapping Mr. Heineken, it's a bit of a strange movie because it just, like with Fast and Furious 7, the problem with um, kidnapping Mr. Heineken is that it's a bit of a messy film because the director doesn't know how to stitch the scenes together properly, he doesn't know what the best way to bridge scenes is, so you've got gaps in the movie where you're thinking, wait a minute, we were here one minute and now all of a sudden it seems to be the scene's resolved the next moment without any explanation of how the scene is actually resolved. So the, a prime example is the, the kidnap Mr. Heineken and also in, in the clip there you heard the kidnap his chauffeur as well. And then it ultimately goes to them having a conversation about how they should hold a ransom. And then it ultimately goes to them of already them putting the ransom in the newspaper and trying to wait for it to come through without anything properly bridging each one of those gaps and making it feel like it is a film. It, it just feels like a selection of storyboard ideas where the, the director has wrote, well, this is how we're going to construct the movie. But he hasn't been able to actually piece them together properly. And so the, the film is a bit of a head scratcher. It's, it's okay acted wise. Um, you've got, like I said, you've got Sam, uh, Sam Worthington in there. And you've also got Ryan Quanton and uh, Jim Sturgis as well. And Anthony Hopkins it doesn't have very much to do apart from shout a little bit and bribe them. But it, it just doesn't feel like a film that it's got any proper structure to it, any tension at all. Um, nothing. You, you, it's just wondering why this movie was made or how this movie got made and how it didn't actually come direct to DVD and how it managed to get a, a theatrical release. Because it just does not feel like a theatrical film. You've got a couple of car chase scenes in it, but that's about it. None of the scenery is actually handled pretty well. Um, the dialogue is a bit ropey at times. So it, it's just a bit of a head scratcher how it, it's managed to get a, a very strange theatrical release as well. Because if you there's a cinema chain which is offering, if you buy a ticket to see this movie, you get the digital download of the film for free as well because it's out on Blu-ray and DVD in a couple of weeks' time. And so it just makes you think, why didn't they just leave it to digital download and out on Blu-ray and DVD? What was the point of re releasing it theatrical? Because it can't be down to Sam Worthington. Sam Worthington isn't en enough of a big name to make a film go direct to the cinema. We've had multiple big um, actors and even they have had sort of like movies that you think should go direct to DVD. But I don't think Sam Worthington is big enough. Ryan Quanton was in two movies that were shelved. And Jim Sturgis, I don't think he can handle the film on his own either. And Anthony Hopkins is probably the biggest name in this. But because these characters don't have very much to do, even though he is the central character of the film, you're just still wondering, I, I, I don't know why this movie is a theatrical release. I don't. Right, that's it for the cinema um, section of this very short show this week. I'll play an advert and I will be back with uh, the Blu-ray and DVD section.
So that is Stuart in, uh, from Page to Screen. He's had a few uh, technical problems over the last week, mainly down to his um, internet connection. He's hoping to be back soon with uh, some new shows. I take part in From Page to Scream, which is the horror show that he does, where alongside Lauren Rebecca Reed of Scream Queen LR, which you definitely follow her on Twitter or on Facebook. She is a fantastic person. She knows a lot about horror. Right, we're into the home release section of this week's show. Um, coming up is reviews of Predestination, Exists, Dark Summer and Electricity, and our TV movie of the week. It'll, uh, I'll go through the Blu-ray and DVD top 10. At number 10, part of the buy one get one free of the Disney's promotion, which is probably coming to an end now considering it's the only one in the chart, is The Lion King. So if you don't own it yet, if this offer's still on, go out and buy it alongside Beauty and the Beast. Not frozen. We don't want that back in the top 10. And number 9 is The Maze Runner. I think this is better than Insurgent. Which just says a lot of things. Considering that this is another one of those post-apocalyptic. Sort like teen action films. And it, it's not bad. It's handled pretty well. The maze sequence is a, the maze is a bit of a daunting thing. And even though it, it's only used sparingly. I think it could have been used a bit better. It, it's still actually. You can definitely tell. The, the turmoil and tension that they're in when they're inside the maze. At number eight is Gone Girl. Could have had a half an hour cut off it. Um, very well acted, very well directed, but I still think David Fincher needs to concentrate on cutting back his films. Stop making them too long. Number seven is Fury. Bit of a messy, muddled up uh, war film, World War Two war, fil war film with Brad Pitt in it. Um, it. It's just a bit too clean cut. It's trying to be a lot like things like Saving Private Ryan, even little bits of Hurt Locker in there and films like that. And I think those movies are far superior. Uh, number six is The New Anti Horrible Bosses 2. Please avoid this. It's awful. The first one is not bad. This one is just insultingly horrible. Number five is The Imitation Game. Benedict Cumberbatch, uh, who plays Alan Turin person one other people anywhere who cracked the enigma code and it's all about how he cracked it alongside his team and what kind of uh, subjugation he had to go through and so it, it's, it's an interesting story from that point number four is hunger games mockingjay part one more of a political film over um, an action film that you've come to expect from the hunger games series it's actually pretty decent. Um, it's a very interesting movie setting up. It, it treats teens now more like adults here. And this is a much... It's a much more interesting film from that standpoint of view. But it's also interesting that this film has come out on Blu-ray and DVD alongside elections in the UK. So it's just timed it perfectly on that front. Number three is Penguins of Madagascar. New entry. It's a fun animated um uh, adventure. The penguins are likable characters. They saw that they were likable characters in the Madagascar series, so they thought, why don't we just make a film from them? And the, the, it handles the idiot minute running time perfectly well. There are some interesting, funny jokes in it. It never lives up to the brilliance of its opening sequence with Werner Herzog doing a voiceover of penguins with little fluffy bum bombs, but it, it's still entertaining. At number two is Paddington. Very, very good. Uh, family adventure old-fashioned family adventure from david year who who did uh, the last two harry potter films and it's got touches of that in there and at number one is the new entry for interstellar obviously it was going to be number one interstellar um it's got a few problems with the father daughter relationship in it it also gets a bit muddled up in the last 15 20 minutes which uh, it, it ends on a bit of a damp squib uh, but it's still a really well-made, well-executed science fiction film. Very intelligent one. Which actually rolls in perfectly with the first DVD release of the week. Which is Predestination. It's directed by the Spirit Brothers. Now, this is a movie which... It is one of those typical films where you need to see it to understand the full aspect of the movie rather than being told about it. But the basic storyline is Ethan Hawke plays um, an officer of kind... In, in the future and he's sent back um, in time to try and finish off a case that he was he, he just finds really difficult in, in doing and so he plays a character only known in the film as the barkeep and he goes back in time to the 1970s to this bar where he meets up with this character who's played by Sarah Snook and uh, they have a conversation in there and she tells him this, her life story about what's happened to her in her life from when she became an orphan to ultimately the time now and during that section there, that's when we discover all the twists and turns that the film has to offer. Here's a clip.
So uh, the film itself is very intelligent. It is one of those science fiction movies where you need to concentrate on it because there are lots of twists and turns. It's not one of those movies where you could go out and make a cup of tea and come back and understand what's going on because you might miss a key element in the movie. It's very well directed by the Spirit Brothers and it's very well acted by Ethan Hawke and Sarah Snook. I think Sarah Snook steals the show because it's a really difficult character to 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 take on now I, I it's really difficult to try and spoil the film because of the fact that there, there, there are easy pitfalls to fall into when reviewing a movie like this where it will give away key elements of the film and so the less you know about predestination the better it is you just need to know the basic elements of the fact that it's very well directed very well acted very intelligent science fiction film which i think needs to be seen um, it's got some really interesting twists, some really interesting elements to it, and I highly recommend Predestination. Um, Exists, however, directed by Eduardo Sanchez, the guy who was behind the Blair Witch Project. He's constantly going to be lumbered with that um, slogan. He also directed the very well-made uh, Lovely Molly, a very creepy, creepy film which he released about three, four years ago. And in this... Over the last couple of years, we've seen a, a slew of movies um, about Bigfoot. We had one which was called Willow Creek, directed by Bobcat Goldthwait, who, who was in the Police Academy movies, which was a bad, bad film. And in this, it centers around, stop me if you've heard this before, a group of kids who go to a cabin in the woods with cameras, hoping to have a good time. However, there is something big and hairy out in the forest which is trying to stop them. Now, you might not have heard the big and hairy part before, but the part where they're in the cupboard in the woods and the part where something's out to stop them, you'll have heard multiple times before. And what Edward, Eduardo Sanchez has gone and decided to do is, is go back to his roots, go back to the Blair Witch Project roots of a sort of like a found footage kind of film, even though this movie is not technically found footage because the footage isn't lost, but it is shot in that style. And so you've got uh, GoPro cams, which are attached to bike helmets. You've got camcorders where one of the characters who will not put his camcorder down no matter what is happening, no matter how many times a Bigfoot beast attacks them, he will always have a, some kind of camera in his hand to videotape what's going on. And so it is the typical tropes of what you've seen before. And... It's okay. It's it's not a special movie at all. The the thing I can see what a big massive plus point is of this movie is he's not afraid to show the beast. Uh, he's not afraid to show Bigfoot because the the down the big huge massive flaw with uh, Willow Creek, the Bobcat Goldthwait's Bigfoot movie, was the fact that he only decided to show the beast at the end of the film. If you're going to do that, though, you need to make sure you've got mountains of tension. So the ultimate payoff is the ultimate payoff. If you don't do that, however, then then um, the movie is just going to be boring, and you're just going to wonder why. Uh, uh, what are you watching? Eduardo Sanchez decides to do the opposite and shows you the beast. But again, you can fall into pitfalls where you think this movie is not going to be tense enough now because there is should be something stark in them, and it should be something that you try not to see very often because it will add tension to the movie. Whereas, in fact, he just goes for the typical jump scares where it might appear at a door or charge at them at a distance or things like that. And so that's the ultimate fault with the film. It just has no no normal scares that you would expect in it, no tension that he brought to something like Lovely Molly, which is annoying because Lovely Molly is a fantastic film. This isn't. This is passable at best. Dark Summer. It's directed by Paul Soleil. Um, we we were supposed to review this a couple of weeks ago in the cinema section. It got a very, very small cinema release. As a matter of fact, it got released in one screen, which was a bit ridiculous, so I'm glad we didn't. It's a very, very straightforward film. It's about a 17-year-old boy who's been put under house arrest by um, his probation officer, who's played by Peter Stormer. Um, and all of a sudden, he starts to see very strange and weird things, especially um, referring to this girl who supposedly... He caused the death of and so with the help of his friends he needs to try and unravel the plot of what's going on it is it, it tries to take tropes from movies like Disturbia the Shia LaBeouf um, film uh, and the very typical sort of like ghost movies so everything from uh, Paranormal Activity to the Andreas Muschietti movie uh, Mama 
to uh, The Conjuring, to Amityville Horror, to anything like that, any movies of that ilk. And the problem with the film is it's not scary at all. It's got an interesting ending to it, an interesting twist to it. So the ending is actually better than the film itself and it's very well handled. It's just annoying that the rest of the film is a bit very mundane and a bit boring. You're much better off going renting out things like Amateurville Horror or The Conjuring or even Mama than you would be to sit down and watch Dark Summer. So it, it, it's just a very... I can see why the film was only released on a couple of screens in the cinema because this is not again a theatrical movie this is a straight to DVD one and it, I think it would have done much better if they, they advertised it that it was a direct to DVD movie rather than just doing it the way they've done it. I'm steamrolling through these this week and the final um, DVD uh, Blu-ray release of the week is Electricity. It's directed by Bryn Higgins. It's a British film. It centers around uh, Lily, who's played by Agnes De uh, Dean, who um, she suffers epilepsy. And so uh, um, she needs to try and hunt down her brother because her mother's passed away and the inheritance has been left. And so the, the film it just centers around her trying to come to terms with the epilepsy that she's got and trying to hunt down her brother. And obviously, throughout the movie, the way the epilepsy is shown is through some bright flashes of the title of the movie, Electricity. You see lots of... If you watch a movie where you see cars driving really fast and the way some directors actually do it is you see lots of red and orange lines going speeding through motorways and uh, things like that. that. That's the way the electricity is in this film. That's the way the epilepsy is shown in the movie. And the rest of the film is just the drama about Lily trying to find her brother with the help of a character who's played by uh, Lenora Critchlow. And that's the part of the movie which I think ultimately feels the interesting part of the film and I think the part of the movie where they should have concentrated a lot more on is a woman come to terms with epilepsy because you do see the outcomes of it and what's actually happening. I know a few people who've got it and from the stories that, uh, that they've said on places like Facebook and Twitter, I can see in this movie what they actually mean. It's really hard to picture when somebody has an epileptic seizure or an epileptic fit, when they see a they do it outside and an accident might happen and few people actually stop to help them and they, they can't remember what, what's what's happened to them. Or ultimately they end up in hospital with bruises and cuts and even maybe even more severe injuries. It's hard to actually visualise that but when you see it in a form like this in the film like Electricity, you can see what kind of turmoil you have to go through and it, it, it must be something horrible to live with because she does have seizures during the film and there's very few people around to help her apart from the uh, person who she befriends in Laura, uh, Lenora Critchlow there's very few people around her and that's the interesting part the drama part where she's trying to look for her brother to try and see her, this is what your, where your inheritance is she, she was split off from her brother when she was young uh, she was very good friends with her brother her brother sort of like helped her through life and he went to a care home and she had to stay with her mother who couldn't care less about her. It's just you think, oh, that might be an interesting drama part. And it's not. It just plays very much like a, a TV movie. Whereas the epilepsy side is the interesting part. And I think the film would have been much more interesting, much more braver if it just followed more of that than it did of um, the, the drama part. So that's it for all the reviews for this week. I've only been going... About 45 minutes, and I've managed to get through six films. So I told you it was a bit of a short, sharp show, just to get something out there, give you my quick thoughts on each one of the films released of this week. Hopefully, Andrew will be back in next week's show. Fingers crossed. A couple of TV moves of the week, just to point out with them. Um, on Channel 5 on Sunday, the 13th at 9 o'clock, you've got the over the top action film Olympus Has Fallen. Uh, White House Down was released around about the same time as this. I think Olympus Has Fallen is the stronger of the film because it realises it needs to be a tongue-in-cheek movie. This one's got Gerard Butler in it. and Whereas White House Down um, tried to be a bit more serious with Channing Potato Head Tatum in it. This one, it just has a lot of fun. Some of the special effects are very, very dodgy. But it is, if you like action films, very much on the guise of things like Independence Day, then you'll love this. And because... I'm doing the show this week. I've got a little bit of a leeway with another film of choice. Um, on film four, on the early hours of Saturday morning, so that's Saturday the 12th at 1.30am, 
It's the Japanese dub of one of the best animated films I've ever seen, Isao Takahata's Grave of the Fireflies. This was released alongside a double bill of um, Hayao Miyazaki's My Neighbor Totoro back in 1988. And this was the last time that Ghibli did a double bill. And My Neighbor Totoro is an amazing children's movie. Grave of the Fireflies is an amazing, effective movie. It all centers around Hiroshima and about a brother and sister who have to try and fend for themselves. And it is harrowing. If you don't cry during Grave of the Fireflies, there is something seriously wrong. And it is in the proper version, the proper uh, one that you should see. Don't watch the dubbed version. I know it's on very early in the morning. But if you've got any kind of recording facility, then record it because it is, it's highly important that I hope, I hope that um, a lot of schools actually show this film because it, it is a very important, interesting film for them to watch. It'll be interesting also to get the point of things like something as hiring as Hiroshima across an animated form rather than showing them documentaries or live action films, show them an animated film that tackles the subject because there's very few of them out there which ta tackles tough subjects like Hiroshima you've got Walton with Bashir which tackles war in Iraq in animated form but if you see an animated film where it tackles a tough subject show that to children because I think they'll latch onto it more so than an action film so that's it for this week's Monday movie show I can finally shut up and you can finally say thank god he has shut up uh, my movie of the week is Fast and Furious 7 it, it was ultimately going to be Fast and Furious 7, so get out to the cinema and see it. It seems that a lot of people in the US have done so because it's broken records, 146 million, which is insane. And it's gone over 300 million worldwide dollars. Um, don't know what the, the total is at the moment in the UK because of the fact that we had Easter Bank holidays. And so it, it, it's really hard to tell what the numbers are going to be until tomorrow when the charts are officially released, which you can find on mondaymovieshow.co.uk you can also drop us an email tell us what you think of the show give us some feedback mondaymovieshow.yahoo.com also we are on iTunes just search for the Monday Movie Show and on Podkicker which is on Android uh, again search for the Monday Movie Show you can leave us feedback there please do so please listen to the show tell as many people as possible about us as well uh, give us some feedback on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash mondaymovieshow or on Twitter, at Monday Movie Show. I'm a cryptic tadpole. And just because I need to, Andrew's at EHDVD. We will be back sometime next week. It will not be on a Monday. Um, details will be posted up on the site on Thursday. Following the nerd.com also, I should mention them. Because if I don't, Mark will probably hurt me. And I hope he doesn't. Um, that's live on Thursday night at uh, 9 o'clock. Hopefully there is a show this week. Fingers crossed. Um... Next week's show, it'll probably either be on a Sunday or on a Tuesday where we'll look at films, including a clip that I'm going to play. Uh, it's a double comedy week. You've got Paul Blart, Mall Cop 2, which I'm not looking forward to as well at all. Uh, but the clip I'm going to play you out with is, my guess and my hope is, The Lesser of Two Evils. It's for Hot Tub Time Machine 2, which is a bit of a mouthful. So until next week, goodbye. <laughs>